Hi everyone! Welcome back to Ina Wonders. And today we have another episode of Let's Fight. And today I am joined by Ralph Ponte, who is a poet, physician, translator, and outdoorsman. <laughs> He's also currently the host of Ang Sabi Nila, um, which is a monthly poetry night that seeks to assert the primal importance of sound in the experience of poetry. So hi, Ralph, a.k.a. Loaf. Loaf is his nickname. Hi, Rina. Yeah, <laughs> I am Loaf. <laughs> so tell me why Loaf. Because my name is Ralph Lawrence, like uh-huh. the brand. La- Ralph Lawrence Fonte. So in college, my blockmates wanted to give me a new nickname because I kept giving other people nicknames. So they said, oh, Lofo? It, no, no, it doesn't work. So they just stuck with Lo. I kind, it kind of stuck because they kept on imposing it on everyone that I'm Lo. So I just embraced it. I mean, it's, it's unique enough and it's fun enough. So, so today we're going to be talking about spoken word versus written word. Both of us have experience in both like the spoken and written medium. So, yes, I am ready to fight. <laughs> Are you ready to fight me? <laughs> okay, so maybe first I want to ask you um, about your thoughts on what you think about the merit of each medium. Okay, uh, honestly, in my head, there really is no divide <laughs> right. between like the page and the stage. I feel like good poems operate well on both the page and the stage. So if it's a good poem, it's going to be good on the page and it's also going to be good when read aloud. So that's my personal take on it. Right. However, having said that, mm. I personally, I feel like a poem achieves its optimum state, its ideal form mm. when read aloud. So I think poetry when spoken, when uttered, poetry as utterance, is the ideal form of, of poetry. poetry. So Especially you agree with like um, that sort of thought that poetry is literature aspiring to music? Yes. Mm-hmm. No. So uh, uh, looking at the history of poetry, uh, even before the technology of writing, we have been creating poems already. And uh, poetry back then is, uh, employed a lot of rhetorical and musical devices in in that in its praxis. So uh, before rhyme and meter were of utmost importance, uh, something wouldn't be called a poem if it didn't have a rhyme, if it didn't have meter. So in a sense, uh, poetry always aspires to musicality, mm-hmm. and that's how that's how I look at it. And if you think about it, I, a lot of songs, especially before, are, po- are poems overlaid okay. onto music. So mm-hmm. there's that. <laughs> right. Yeah, so that's, that's what I think about it. I see. No, um, I tend to agree. Uh, wow, that's not a very good way to start fighting. <laughs> but, it's a but, discussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a discussion. But um, I tend to agree in that I don't think you can isolate when it comes to poetry like i don't think that you can divorce like the musical aspect of it mm, with yeah. yeah with what it is like i think that poem that did nothing sonically wouldn't be a very good poem yes but, exactly right um but yeah. i think the thing that um not really bothers but maybe the qualms that i have with the spoken word sometimes have to do more with this just this um sort of visage of a personal story i feel like Mm. when something is performed or when poetry is performed by an artist it becomes so idiosyncratic to the artist that Mm -hmm. it's almost like it's strange to me to perform someone else's piece like um in a lot of the poetry events that i've been to there have been people who have covered certain um, like spoken word pieces and for me they never seem to resonate so I think Uh um, the reason why I feel like poetry on the page has a deeper resonance for me 
really has to do with the fact that I can read it in my own voice or I don't mm-hmm. have like the the ghost of the of the writer of the writer as yeah. persona yeah 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 exactly exactly I feel like there's more room to play with um, uh, poetry hmm. I, I do agree with that because like well there's a difference between like the spoken word movement and performance poetry in general and I feel like okay performance poetry goes beyond uh, the spoken word movement, although there, are, there is clearly a huge overlap. But anyway, I, I do agree that for a lot of spoken word poems, mm-hmm. uh, because spoken word has been tied to identity politics as well, right. uh, there's a right. tendency for the writer to act as persona for the poems that they recite and the poems that they write. Mm-hmm. And in a sense, it it's not necessarily a problem, but it I agree that it limits the the eff- efficacy, effectivity of the form. In that, if you can't divorce the voice of the writer from his or her poetry, mm-hmm. then you're automatically limiting a certain inter limiting a poem to you're shoehorning it into a certain interpretation already, into a certain voice, certain box that conforms with who the, the person is. Versus yeah. if, if it's found poetry, you, you read something, then it's more open to a universe of interpretations. Definitely. And so, for me, I think it's, it's not just interpretation, it's also the cadence. Like, speaking of musicality, I feel like there's a certain... Um, yeah, maybe I am pertaining specifically to the spoken word movement. Because I think uh, it's a little bit more fluid when it's like written poetry that's read aloud. Mm -hmm. But like with uh, spoken word poems, I feel like there's a certain rhythm or like a certain tune that a lot of people employ, you know? Like, I think you know that. um, Yeah. yeah. It's a tendency because I think, no, because a lot of uh, the newer, like if, if, if a poet is just starting out like performing, Mm -hmm. of course, you would try to copy the tendencies of your favorite poets. And okay. it just so happened that a lot of a lot of Filipino poets also, not just in the Philippines, a lot of poets everywhere ha- are influenced by like American West Coast mm-hmm. delivery of, of poetry, like right. in Francisco and mm-hmm. wherever. So I think there is that pitfall to consider. But on the other hand, uh, just yesterday I was watching um, uh, Sonnet 109 by William Shakespeare as performed by Ron Kapinding. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's an actor. And it just reminded me of how some poems, I only understood the meaning of once I heard them read aloud. And it, it's, mm-hmm. it's, uh, these poems are less contemporary, so they, they don't necessarily, uh, or they aren't necessarily haunted by the performance of the author themselves. Yeah. But mm-hmm. it's still, I think, uh, falls into the whole poems as performance or poems as spoken. That like so the Shakespeare sonnets, for instance, I was uh, listening to to like performances of Shakespeare sonnets in the original pronunciation, and it's it's a bit more musical. It's a bit more memorable to me. It makes more sense now hearing uh-huh. these poems read aloud versus just grappling with them on the page. Right, right. Yeah. No, I, I understand that. I feel like the delivery also sort of lends to that context that yeah. might be lost on us, like just sort of going straight to the text. Um, you know, like on its I'd, I'd, I'd like to add something though. Like, mm, sure. the, I think some, sometimes, because you said like there's a repetitive cadence and I think... Right falling into the trap of like using a repetitive cadence in interpreting each and every poem you, re- you read aloud. I think a lot of the time it just detracts from the poem right. rather than adds to it. Because mm-hmm. each poem has its own internal rhythm that you have to analyze before you actually start performing it. And you have to, you have to close read it first. Basically, I, I think that if you're going to perform a poem, you have to perform close reading first. <laughs> you have to identify which parts are important, which words are important, which where is the volta, etc., etc. Because if you just apply the a certain, I 
whenever I see you, uh, da, 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 da. It, it becomes sing song. It, 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 the, the, the listener, the audience is distracted by how you read it, not mm-hmm. necessarily what it's about. Right. right. So, so sometimes falling into, a lot of the time, if you fall into that trap, then you're doing the poem a disservice rather than actually improving your listeners understanding of it so, right. yeah i agree i agree i feel like um although yeah although the performance is a thing in itself it also kind of lends or should lend to the written form of the poem yeah. on the page so sort of jumping off of that do you think that all performance poetry has to be written down first like, do you think that it should be, yeah, should be relegated to the page before it's performed on the stage? Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is this uh, this is a question I grapple with in my own practice. Mm-hmm. I perform by like Basan, and I can basically uh, the form requires you to be able to uh, craft poems on the spot basically it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be poetic but it has to conform to the certain form to rhyme and meter you have to be able to deploy rhyme and uh statements in rhyme and meter at the spur of the moment and mm-hmm. i i practice that and i think yes okay you can not all poems have to be written down right but uh, and, and 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 they have a friend who doesn't actually write down his poetry he records them, recites them from memory, and mm-hmm. revises them accordingly. But I think mm-hmm. the issue isn't necessarily the writing of the text mm-hmm. on the paper, but the revision of it. Uh, some, like, but there are forms that necessitate poetry as a fleeting phenomenon, like balagtasan or right. other impromptu poetry forms. And I think it's, it's valid, so it doesn't always have to be written. But I would contend that the best poems would work both uh, read aloud and uh, and written down. So while the process doesn't necessarily have to be text written text to to orality, it could be orality to text. But right. I think the requirement for a good poem is that it operates. It can operate on both levels. Right. Right. Did I make any sense? Yes, yes, you made a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, I, I tend to agree. Um, I was just curious about it, I guess, because I am very interested in the relationship between the written word and the spoken word, because it's also something that I also grapple with, I guess, in, <laughs> in my own sort of um, uh-huh. poetics and in the stuff that I've been working on. I used to make these sort of poetry short films on YouTube Um, yeah and my main hesitation with performing those poems live was precisely that I didn't want it to just be like a poem that I was reading I wanted it to be something that would be indivorceable from its medium which was that Uh, sort of performance yeah so uh, yeah so that's something that is tricky for me because on one hand I would like for it to fulfill the requirements of both, but also um, does that mean that the tightness of it as a poem or like the necessity of its form, does that mean that I compromise that? Yeah, so. it, I, I guess it, it's a tough question to answer. You know? Like it depends on, on, on the specific poem itself as well. Like what, what does the poem ask of you? And I think, not all poems are easy to perform. I Definitely. Think. Like some poems necessitate quiet, a certain quietness in reading, and not all reading venues would provide that that atmosphere. Some are more, some are more performative. You know, they're more de- uh, declamatory, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, one of the one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Michael Carosa, he. He is one of the best examples, I think, of a person who is able to navigate both mm-hmm. the page requirement and the performative requirement of the poems. Um, he has 
he has a he has a poem called Hawakan and mm. uh, it's erotica and there is a repetition in it. Hindi lamang hawakan ng kamay ang pag it, it, it gets repeated uh, several times in the poem. And on the page, oh, it, it works really well. The images are tight, uh, the mm-hmm. poem flows, there's, there's physicality to it, the enjambments work. But when read aloud, it acquires a certain, a different meaning altogether. And what I noticed hearing him perform his pieces again and again, sometimes, he revises them on the spot, like they're not on the printed. Uh, like some of the words change depending on, I don't know, his mood or the audience maybe. And I think that's the beauty of having a text version and having a performed version. Like right. it doesn't have to be high fidelity. Sometimes the lo-fi version, <laughs> the lo-fi quality of the of the performed piece adds a layer of meaning, a layer of interpretation to the written text that enriches the experience of grappling with the poem in both contexts. Right, right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it's like, um, it's like the new iteration is not necessarily just a copy of the original. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's its own animal. Mm. Speaking of the audience, during like performances and stuff like that um and this is just out of curiosity i feel uh, like uh, i'm straying <laughs> away from the from the flow of the <laughs> of the discussion that i put together <laughs> but um i'm just curious like um about reading the room like how does that sort of impact the way that um a poem is performed mm-hmm. well in my experience, yeah. uh, reading the room sometimes, may, parang ano, it's it's the it's when you begin reciting a set you prepared, what happens is sometimes depend depending on the mood of the audience or on the quality of the audience or like the character of the audience. <laughs> what happens is sometimes I remove some stuff from my set list and let it add <laughs> other things. Like, is this appropriate? Is this an appropriate poem for this event? Is this uh, is the vocabulary or like the persona appropriate for this context, etc. Mm-hmm. Et mm-hmm. So, okay, there's that aspect. And then another one is uh, in terms of performativity. Um, when performing, if the audience isn't so receptive, sometimes it becomes harder, of course. It becomes harder for you as a performer. So sometimes the poem suffers as a result. Like there, there, there suddenly is a tendency to be more theatrical and made some, but in the, in the, just just to capture the attention of the audience. But sometimes, ha, huh, there's over theatricality. Like the mm-hmm. poem doesn't have to be that dramatically read. Sometimes the pauses don't. Uh, are, you, sometimes you don't respect the pauses enough because if you, if you feel like the audience is already uh, not, not listening to you, then like the the tendency to rush through the poem becomes more pronounced. Tendency to overemphasize some phrases or words becomes highlighted. So there's definitely a challenge there to maintain control of your performance in the face of an unreceptive audience. But yeah. on the other hand, mm-hmm. if your audience is receptive and is intent on listening to you, it, add, it gives you more confidence and adds more power to your words mm-hmm. because the, you reflect the energy off of each other. So you're more confident with maintaining pregnant pauses, with emphasizing important lines, with uh, basically infusing more emotion and passion into whatever it is you're reading. So I've experienced that with both my own poems and the uh, poems I've covered, like Bal- uh, Balagtas and Rolando Pino. And mm-hmm. There's really an unparalleled pleasure performing to an interested audience. And I feel like uh, an uninterested audience is probably one of my biggest fears. <laughs> Same. <laughs> I feel like uh, it's a sort of thing that can be a little bit sore 
crushing is because of yeah, yeah. personal poetry is. Like even if it's not your own poem, mm-hmm. there's something yeah, yeah, exactly. personal in choosing to perform a poem, even if it's by someone else. And sometimes like I've experienced this. I've felt the words die in my mouth even before I recite the so Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it happens. Yeah, so. <laughs> okay. Which you don't experience yeah. in page. Because, like, right. okay, I'm done with this. It's out there. So, whatever written flourishes you did, it's the onus is transferred to the, to the reader to right. grapple with your, with your work. So, there's, yeah. I, I guess that's an advantage, like, page poetry has over, over performed. Poem. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like um, with poetry on the page, like one of the things that I enjoy the most about it is being able to play with space. Um, although, of course, there are ways of translating that into performance as well. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, the body is a very dynamic thing. So I feel like that um, can also play into performances and performativity. But what I like about page poetry or what I find very engaging about it as a reader is, um, well, as a reader and as a writer, is that you can make the words move. And there is that sort of thrill within the reader that they will only know on that level of aloneness, I I guess. I think there's like that certain quiet in which page poetry allows you to experience the thing in your own voice and to experience the words or like the cadence of the words in this way that's very quiet and personal and not informed by an audience. So one of the things that I've been thinking about lately is uh, this sort of classical argument or um, I guess not fight but like disagreement in which serves which better like ecritor versus parole. (laughs) which we were sort of talking about earlier. Um, yeah, so what are your thoughts on that? Uh, okay, in, in, terms of, in terms of the nature of uh, convincing someone, in terms of uh, being compelling, mm-hmm. parole will always be, the oratory will always be, more compelling mm-hmm. to uh, it's a more it's a more powerful device for convincing people uh, because there is something about oration about a human voice mm-hmm. speaking that is more convincing to the heart to the emotion mm-hmm. than than the cold rationality or rather the colder rationality of a written text because there is more of an interpersonal element mm. when it comes to linguistic use. Okay. Uh, the decision to use language based on the personal tendencies, mm. and the, uh, your idiolect, your social deck, uh, is in, 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 a, in an interpersonal context is, is more powerful. It, it becomes more convincing in the moment, especially. Right. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's that utility to it. Uh, of course, on the other side of it, I, I think inter- uh, it's important to, of course, codify things right. to, in or- to write things down mm-hmm. in order to be more analytical, be more, for a more analytical and a more critical approach. It, which in the long run might actually serve as a better way of convincing people because of solid argumentation. So I think it's less of a dichotomy right. than two different ways of approaching rhetoric. Mm-hmm. So I think they have their own uses. And in terms of solidifying marginal perspectives, in terms of putting forth new perspectives, transcending, uh, and Ecuador is more, um, 
effective in transcending uh, codified and traditional modes of thinking and linguistic use mm -hmm. because it is it's able to deploy language in a more pointed in a more rational more critical manner than right. and the more fluid aspect of the role so that's what i think <laughs> <laughs> okay um, okay um no, that's, that's like um, an interesting way to look at it. Um, and I agree on the point of um, how like a spoken thing or like um, creation will always be more engaging instantly because there is that immediacy. And I think that if someone is talking, well, for the most part, if some may be except in a grade five classroom, if someone is talking, um, <laughs> people will want to listen, right? Or yeah, there's yeah, yeah. part of that um, premise that you have to listen. And even the way that uh, spoken word events are set up, like there's a stage, um, there's the lights, there's all of that. Um, yeah, so I definitely agree on that front. But I also feel like, I don't know, I feel like the page isn't necessarily something that's as um, cold or sort of as rational as we might think or as we might sort of presume it to be. And something that okay, okay. kind of uh, comes to mind when I think about the whole parole versus equitor thing is zines or, you know, like poetry projects. Um, Anne Carson has this collection called Float and it's like 30 plus um, zines that are put together and you can read them in any order that you want so mm -hmm. yeah so it's it's very interesting because it is very fluid in that sense that um the meaning changes depending on how you fix it how you yeah how you arrange like, it okay yeah what order you go in and then there's there are phenomenons like phenomenons <laughs> there are phenomena <laughs> <laughs> phenomena like uh, at BLTX, like all of those octopi, <laughs> octopi, yeah, the octopuses. <laughs> yeah, so there are like um, all of these zines that are very personal, mm. also and very ah. attention catching in the sense okay. that there is that freedom of expression. Yeah, okay, I didn't mean to say that, like. The mm. page is called. I mean, okay. just the other day I was underlining Garcia Marquez. And, you know, <laughs> with every line, but but anyway, I I think like in terms of a comparative, right, right, comparatively, like mm -hmm. there is less fire on on a written medium rather than something that is performed. Right. Parang, in terms of comparison, maybe maybe it's a bit, it's not as fiery as as something that is right. orated or or, or performed. But I, I do agree that you know, there there is a certain fluidity as well, and there is fire burning in pages. Like, <laughs> okay. So when it comes to meaning, I also have like another sort of question or something that's been on my mind as of late. Uh, when it comes to meaning and meaningfulness. Um, do you think that, like, what do you think each medium kind of gains from itself? And in turn, what does it lose when it's translated into the other? Because I feel like um, what I like about written poetry is that it allows me to delay making up my mind. So I think, mm -hmm. uh, like, immediacy for, for spoken word or for performed poetry is a plus, but I feel like there's also there's also this um, non lingering that I think, yeah, yeah. That also can take away from it sometimes. Yeah, I I, I do agree. Like uh, the the benefit of uh, poems that you read uh, is that you can go go through them again and again. And again. So the meaning making is a repetitive process. Right. that you can do on your own time basically you can read it again and again and basically you understand it more and not much meaning is lost between between the signifier and the signifier so in terms of spoken poetry 
sometimes, especially for longer words, a lot of the, especially if it's, if it doesn't use repetition as much as a rhetorical device, mm. sometimes the me, some of the meaning gets lost in the process yeah. of the performance. Mm. I mean, it, it could still be wonderfully performed and the words could still be exquisite, but the, the, the trade-off is that the audience only actually partially understands the poem. Right. And I read somewhere before that, well, there is that trade-off, but there is still a pleasure in language only partially understood. And I think I like the advantage, right? Yeah. So the advantage of the spoken word in that case is that although it cannot linger as a whole, per se, it creates an impression. And certain lines will, of course, uh, linger in your, in your head. That, like, maybe the most important lines and lines that struck you. But aside from that, I think the, the most, the advantage, the, the most important advantage for me of uh, per, a performed piece over a written piece is that it embodies the lusciousness of language. Mm. It allows you to bodily experience language as an art form because the sonic quality of it allows you to allows language to suffuse your body basically. It enters mm. your ears and you experience it that way. And I don't know, listening to listening to language uh, elevated through poetry being read aloud is is really akin to music. It's not music per se, but the pleasure is similar. When we listen to music, we don't always understand what it means, right. but we comprehend it as a thing of beauty mm -hmm. automatically. And even when reading, I think uh, there are echoes of this. Because when we read, we don't grapple with them as visual, purely visual things. Right. When we read a line, we hear it. And that's how we grapple with all poetry as, mm -hmm. as sonic devices, not necessarily as, uh, devi as language necessarily heard by the ears. But when you, when you read a line, when you read a book, all of the words there have sound that you interpret in, that you interpret the words there as sounds that you hear internally. Right. And that's, that's what I think. <laughs> right. So it's my turn to <laughs> nod. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I agree. It's like there's sort of an internal listening, I guess, mm -hmm. um, where the listening doesn't just become a matter of what is uttered, but it's sort of like, I guess, if you were to read the lyrics of a song that you like, you would hear yeah. the melody regardless. Yeah. Yes. Hmm. I have another assertion. No? So, okay. like some poets would assert that the line hmm. is a unit of breath. Right. right? And uh, I would say that poetry written on the page approximates the sound of how we would read it. Mm -hmm. Like line cuts are just for, I mean, that, that's one benefit of writing. Line, sometimes you can add meaning in terms of line cuts. Right. But also, when you cut lines, you force the reader to stop reading and move on to the next line. And therefore, right. you enact a certain sonic quality inter, uh, for the reader by your decisions of how to lay out the page. Where, where do you indent? Where do you cut your line? Mm. What punctuation marks are you? So I think, in a sense, uh, poetry on the page is like musical notation. Right. When you write down music, you codify it, you add a layer of meaning, you allow people to engage it uh, in a more critical manner, you allow people to be able to understand, grapple with it more. But at the same time, it's also a guide mm. for how you should read how you should hear the right. music in the poem. So there's also that, I think, aside yeah. from... So it's sort of like um, poetry on the page, in a way, 
as sort of like a guidepost also to how it would be performed or how it would be read, how it would be listened to. Yeah, that's, that's what I think at least. Yeah. How do you feel about poetry that seems as though it doesn't necessarily want to be read? Like I keep thinking of Jose Garcia Villa. The bashful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and all those poems that are just you know, um, obviously only made for the page. or With all the commas. Yeah, with all the commas or um, the ones with uh, like a bar in between them. So like word, like text, bar, text. Yeah, mm -hmm. where there would be, I guess, almost like close to no way to translate what is written into what is spoken. Okay, so the bashful one. I have a friend who performed the bashful one. Oh, really? It was, <laughs> it was just a joke performance. He just stood on stage. <laughs> He sighed and that was it. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, it, it, Jose Garcia Villa is interesting. Um, there, there are certainly poems like The Bashful One. For everyone who doesn't know, The Bashful One is this poem. Comma. Period. <laughs> <laughs> Which is still, I think, an approximation of language. Mm. Uh, there are no words, but it still approximates how we use language. And I think the point is actually the lack of words. Like right. A bashful person would be like this. That attempt. And then the resignation. So I think it's still, it's still a notation of, of actual human experience. Of, in this case, an attempt at language. A failed attempt at language. What about uh, the Emperor's for, new sonnet? Well, that's just, it operates on a different level. I think. <laughs> 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 ah, no, but also, that also operates on a lack, on the assumption that poetry is linguistic. Mm -hmm. Right? So, in the Emperor's new clothes, the Emperor asserts that, hey, I have, I have this magnificent clothing, therefore, you should all bow down to me, but no one sees it. Right. In the same in the same in, in the same vein, I think the Emperor's new sonnet would play on that expectation. Like, hey, this is a sonnet, 14 lines. But there are no lines. And it's both intertextual and metatextual in mm -hmm. that sense. So it also plays on the expectation that poetry is a language, a, a craft of language. And the absence of any thing in the, mm. in the piece is the thing itself. The thing itself. Yeah. And I think there's sort of this, I see it more, I guess, as um, kind of a spectrum where you get poems that are very visceral and very sort of passionate and sort of mm -hmm. driven by that. And then you have poems that are a little bit more like mind games, which I think, which I really think is sort of what, uh, what Vilia like doing and because he's friends with ee cummings right so yeah. i think they share that <laughs> they share <Yeah>. the tendency <laughs> if if they were here now i think that they would have like their own indie press probably true, <laughs> true. but i also do think that uh because uh the written word is a technology of language like language itself is a technology Right. And like the written word is just an, another incarnation of language. Mm -hmm. Speech and the written word are just two aspects of the technology of language. And okay. I think your examples, the, the ones you mentioned, are very telling of what poetry is. That mm -hmm. The art is poetry and the medium is language. Right. So all of these things that we've been talking about, uh, Garcia Villa, E.E. Cummings, the more recent spoken word movement. I think they're all attempts at exploring the limits of language. I agree. <laughs> There's no I, have a question. I have a question for you. Okay, go. Okay. Uh, what is your favorite poem and what's your favorite line from a poem? Oh my god, my favorite poem? Like, ever? Yeah. Yes. Um, or... You can hmm. choose three if it's too difficult to choose. Okay. One. okay. Well, it changes. Like it changes. Actually, wait lang. I'll get. I'll get the book because I have the book. Okay, go. 
So hi, I'm Dope, and I'm taking over We Know Wonders YouTube page. Okay. Uh, wait. Oh no, she's back. Huh? Nothing. Okay. No, I said I, I said I was taking over your YouTube page. <laughs> Low floppers. Low floppers. Okay. <laughs> so right now, like uh, my favorite poem is uh, wait lang, wait lang. Maling book. Maling book. Wait. <laughs> my favorite poem right now, I think, is okay. So this poem is by Emily Berry. Uh huh. And it's called Bad New Government. Bad and, New Government. Yeah, Bad New Government. And the way that it's written is like this. So, yeah. Very, very different, I guess. Then, it like, it makes you rotate yeah. the book. Yeah, it does. And it's the last poem in this collection, also. And I think. Um, my favorite line, or pati bang two lines? <laughs> Parang so, hirap naman eh. Okay, so my favorite two lines from this are probably the last two lines. Um, because throughout the poem, she sort of talks about this bad new government, or like a post-revolution government, which is hearkening back to sort of um, our notions about, or like our preconceived sort of images of Soviet Russia, I guess, after the revolution. Mm -hmm. So the last two lines are, Later I will call to tell you about the new prime minister, the worrying new developments, and about how I'm writing my first political poem, which is always about my love for you. Okay. Sort of brings together like the personal and the political, which I like. Nice. Like, somehow it reminds me of Deaf Republic by Yuli Kamis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have the ebook because we were talking about it the other day, right? I haven't started yeah, yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, but yeah. It's amazing. But here's my question. Okay. When you think about that line, how do you remember it? Mm -hmm. Right. That's a good question. It's weird. It's weird. But I'm, hmm. I don't think I remember it as sound, though. Like, I tend to remember it more as an image, I think, or as the setting of the poem. Mm. As the image it creates. Yeah, as the image it creates. Not the words on the page, but the world inside the poem. Mm. Okay, this is back part, but I, what I was trying to... <laughs> <laughs> you were trying to get me to say that I remembered it as, uh, no, as, as sound. sound. Yeah, <laughs> which is how I remember my favorite lines. For instance, E.E. E. Cummings. Okay. The, the voice of your eyes is deeper than all roses. Nobody, not even the rain, has such small hands. Mm -hmm. so, somewhere I had never traveled that video. And I don't know, like, maybe it's a personal thing, but for me, that's because I, I don't always have these books around. And like, yeah. when, when, I, when I remember a line, it always comes as a song, mm. an image, maybe, like as a work of imagination, right? Right. But I never remember how it looks in the page. Mm. There's always, there's always that, oh, I experienced it as, as a line right. in my head, mm. not as, eventually, of course, there's, there's that layer of, oh yeah, I read it too. But, but what sticks with me is how I experienced it as sound and image. Okay. Um, anything else you want to add to the discussion? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'd like to say that I don't think one is superior to the other, mm -hmm. but I do think that performing poetry elevates what is on what is already good on the page. Right. So I, because it adds a certain level of, add, it adds some it adds it adds a little layer of me, not level. It adds a layer of me to the experience of of a poem and that grappling with something. Partially understood and fleeting gives it a haunting quality that would stay with audiences. Right. So, ayo, parang I also think that because of the history of poetry, how we all really started with orality, mm. I think the the performative aspect of poetry 
will always persist. Mm, sometimes separate from the page, but a lot of the times, I think poems on the page that resonate with us often call to us and ask us to read them aloud. Anyway, maybe that's just me, but right. I, no, my favorite I agree. poem. Yeah, I think that that's really the impulse, right? Like, yeah. an impulse, like to read it aloud, even when writing the poems. I think. <laughs> Same. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, in my practice, like, I know my poem is still uh, in need of revision if I can't read it aloud straight. Mm -hmm. Like, if, mm -hmm. I, if I have to stop, wait, this doesn't feel right. Like, this doesn't sound right. So I have to revise it still. Right, right. Same. Or if I'm sort of irritated by certain internal rhymes or even like, yeah, yeah. Rhymes, like I don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> or sometimes, sometimes if I feel like, oh, there's too much internal rhyme here. There's too much alliteration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it feels too neat. It's sort of like yeah. a braid and you want to pull out like some of the... Yeah. yeah. I think that's it, really. I think we've talked pretty exhaustively about it. Um, yeah. yeah. That it's like <laughs> every... Fight. Yeah, this fight was not a fight. Don't worry, next time. <laughs> but yeah, it's more like uh, each poem creates its own context. Thank you so much, Lo, for joining us on the channel. Thanks for taking over my channel. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me for this. It was an honor and a pleasure discussing poetry. Same. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to plug, like for Ang Sabi Nila and maybe other poetry things that you're doing? I will plug Ang Sabi Nila. So Ang Sabi Nila is a monthly poetry night. Uh, we used to hold it every month, every last Saturday of the month at Ruins in Poblacion in Makati. However, because of the excellent community quarantine, these past two months, we've been doing online shows uh, over Facebook Live. So, um, we actually had Wina last March over uh, at Ang Sabi Ni Lockdown 1. So, if you're interested in listening to her poem there, uh, I'm sure she posted it yeah, on I Instagram did. I <laughs> did. <laughs> and on YouTube. Yeah. But if you'd like to listen to the other uh, poets, other women poets that month, uh, just go on Ang Sabi Nila's Facebook page and the live stream is there. Uh, if you're also interested in listening to more po more performed poetry uh, on our stage, um, just visit us on YouTube and Facebook. It's Ang Sabi Nila, A-N-G-S-A-B-I-N-I-L-A. And we have uh, lots of videos from uh, our previous uh, poetry nights uh, featuring a lot of awesome writers, including uh, Lourdes Vera and um, Gran Pascual, Juan X, Jerry Grasho, Edgar Calabes Samar, and more award-winning and emerging poets in the uh, Philippines. So, yeah. Yay! Thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for watching. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it. Leave us some of your thoughts below. Uh, what do you think about poetry? What kind of poetry do you enjoy? Yeah, and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you next time. Bye! Bye, love! Bye, Rina. Thank you!